and let me welcome all of us another Wednesday afternoon to Bible study. It has been a lovely couple of weeks as we went into the scriptures to look at relationships. We have been examining and studying and talking about the subject of relationship and in particular the marriage relationship. Uh, we did indicate that we would go beyond that because relationships goes beyond that and there is a relationship between parents and children. Yes, there is a relationship between brothers and sisters and there are relationships where just men and women, men and men, general friendships are concerned. But we have been spending time uh, looking at the relationship between a husband and a wife. Uh, this one represents a covenant. It goes very deep and as such we want to or wanted to spend the lion's share of the time looking and examining that. The lack of information in many instances and therefore the lack of knowledge has caused untold hurt to many individuals in relationships and I really feel that in going through in the way that we have been going through it will lend itself to allow for us to take a, another look a more deeper biblical perspective as to what marital relationships are all about. I believe that many of us might have had it wrongly constructed in our minds and therefore what we are doing, drilling into the scriptures and digging into things is very important for us because it will allow us to see from another perspective through the prism of the word of God that maybe we have been approaching this whole business of marital relationship incorrectly and it is my prayer that we take some time and you know I hope we have been reviewing the little notes that we have scribbled I hope we have every now and then gotten an opportunity to look back at something that might have been said that meant something to you in particular it is very important at the end of the day we must be edified at the end of the day we must be assisted and what better way to be assisted by and through the words of almighty god we have gone through quite a bit but there are a few of the things that we had delved into that is worth mentioning again before we move on and I would venture to mention one or two of the things that we had said before because of how significant they were and how impacting they can be. I know when we started and uh, went through a few of the sessions we stressed on the fact that men a tremendous responsibility was given to us by Almighty God the responsibility to ensure that the health and the well-being of our marital relationship the responsibility was placed on us as men to ensure that it follows after the pattern that God intended and so we have this tremendous role to play men. We have this tremendous responsibility placed on our shoulders. It is not suggesting that we by ourselves, because it's a union and it, is, it represents two persons coming together. So we each have certain roles to play. And when we rehearse at some point later on, we will put it together in tabular form and we will look at the role of the man 
and we will also look at the role of the woman and we list some things coming down the line but that does not take away from the fact that the responsibility the ultimate responsibility for the health and the well-being of the relationship of the marriage rests with the man with the husband and we cannot shirk away from that we cannot hide around the bush we have to face it recognize it and accept it and we have made this point abundantly clear we had looked in the book of genesis we had gone both from in the beginning with adam and eve we had looked at abraham and how god spoke to him couldn't hide anything from him simply because he looked and see in Abraham a man that was able to bring together. He took seriously and understood his responsibility as the head of his house that he would command his children and his household in following the Lord. And God spoke specifically about Abraham in relation to that, even though Sarah was there. So it, we, we, without going back into the scriptures, it is a fact, men, that that responsibility is placed squarely on our shoulder. And it is important that we recognize men, understand, and embrace that. We had also looked that, at the fact that this marriage, this union of a man and a woman, as they got together, uh, it involves a covenant between God and the, the two parties, the parties coming together, so that it is the husband, it is the wife, and God was there as, as witness. And that coming together into covenant relationship we indicated that it was very significant, it was very deep, it was very much binding, and therefore we have to be very careful how we treat with our marriage. And it came across even more forcefully because the results of this covenant brings into being a replica of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And we have gone into that. So I am just um, reiterating this point for emphasis because it is important. And the more we examine, the more we go into, delve into issues relating to relationships and marriage, it is the more we will see that it reflects what happens with Christ and the church and we must never lose sight of that fact very 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 important so I, I encourage firstly our men to see our God-given responsibility uh, to recognize the authority that he has placed in our hands and to take our role as the one who was given the authority and the responsibility to ensure the health and well-being of our family, of our household. I want us to take this charge seriously. If we find that we have faltered along the way, then we must see God. Then we must get back to our partners. Then we must get things straightened out. We must acknowledge where we might have gone wrong and might not have done it as it was supposed to have been done. Uh, acknowledge and make amends, so to speak, to know that we know, to put things in the order that it should be in. We are not going through these studies to highlight failures and therefore we have failed, so you are doomed. No. We are going through these studies, yes, to highlight some of the areas where we would have gone wrong with the intention that we take and make the necessary moves, make the necessary steps to fix those things that might have been broken. 
because things can get broken because we didn't know. Well, we are all learning and we are all coming into knowledge. And the fact that we now know, then it signals that we must make the move to fix the things that might have been broken. And so let's, let's do what has to be done. This covenant, brothers and sisters, must not be taken lightly. And I cannot overemphasize the significance of that. Uh, we recognize from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, and I'm not turning to it. I, I, I want to bring a point out. And in fact, before I bring it out, let me thank the many ladies because I find that many ladies have written and called to say thank you, Pastor Daly, for I'm not sure why the ladies call and so many of them for that matter. Uh, but they were saying thank you for highlighting some things. Thank you for bringing out some things. And I, I am not sure, I am hoping that I am wrong, but I am not sure if it is because I might have established what is biblical and pointed out to men the roles and the responsibilities that they have, and especially as it relates to their leadership and their headship, yes, of the household, of the family, of the marriage. And that if it must happen, it must start with men. That is a fact. And I would encourage any men that think otherwise to look back at the things that we have said. Look back at the scriptures that we have gone through. And let us embrace what has been given to us and seek to do it well. But if that is the reason why the ladies have indicated and said thanks and that they are praying for me, I, 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 I hope that when we are finished this evening, you will still want to pray for me because I wanted to touch on a particular area which is very important to the well-being of the relationship, of the marriage, but it speaks now to an aspect that the lady is responsible to carry out if the thing is going to work. And it is biblical and we want to put it in its perspective so that you know we are clear because i believe that god's intention is for us as men and as women to have rules to play our roles to come together as one and each support the other it is supposed to be mutually reinforcing in this relationship so we both strengthen and prop up and lift up each other. It's not one or the other. Both have, have a role to play. And we want to take the time to go through to make sure that the thing is balanced because the Bible is a balanced book and God established things with a certain order. He sets it up. He has his reasons, even if we do not know. But if he says that a man has that responsibility, then he does. And if he goes further, to show that there are some things that as the wife you must do and he outlines it and it is in scripture then I submit to all our ladies to take heed to what the word of God says now we are living in a time when it is said that this is a new era this is a new period this is a new dispensation this is the postmodern environment and so things that used to happen back in days of old don't look for it to happen again and i can understand that in many instances i can understand that we have to change the mode of and the method of evangelism per se we know that we have been called to evangelize and we have to use different methodologies as we go but while the method will change, and while the mode of operations, brothers and sisters, will change, I safely want to tell you that the, the message cannot change. And it is the same thing 
that is being applied even to relationships. Because when they came to Jesus um, in Matthew 19 and tried to trick him, Jesus took them all the way back to, be to the beginning. They tried to say, to trick Jesus, you know, into asking him a question and pulling him as to see how he would have answered it in Matthew chapter 19. But notice Jesus' answer to those Pharisees that came to him. He said, it was not so in the beginning. In the beginning, male and female created them. In the beginning, you know, and he started to go through the process and told them what happened and how Adam and Eve came together and formed the first couple and showed that that was God's intent. He took them to the beginning even though they were thousands of years beyond the beginning period. I'm making the point that even today in the 21st century, folks might be coming to us to try to tell us not so those are things of old and this is how things are to be done. But just as Jesus did over there in Matthew chapter 19 and took them back to the beginning, which is right in the book of Genesis, we must also, and I must take you to the beginning if you are uncertain. Anybody that feels that the Bible is archaic and old-fashioned and therefore embrace the system of the world or the, the cultural norms to justify how marriages ought to be established and run, I dare say, brothers and sisters, you have it wrong, not the Bible. The Bible will stand the test of time. Where salvation is concerned, you can depend on the Bible. Where the word of God is concerned, generally, you can depend on the Bible. Where marriages are concerned, you can depend on the Bible. It is never out of style. It is never out of fashion. It will never lose the power because the word of God is always quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword if it was in the 12th century or today in the 21st century or if it was in the first century when the church was just born if it goes or if it went back into the bc era brothers and sisters the word of god is true let god be true and every man a liar so this is not the time to question and to try to cast aspersions on the words of almighty god let's rivet it in our minds let's reinforce it in our systems the word of god is our guide the word of god is our manual and we must not allow our culture or any systems of the world to dictate how marriages ought to be. It ought to flow according to the program and the plan that the originator had in his mind. And he has revealed it in the book. And so it is important that we take our cue, not from the world, not from culture or cultural norms, but our cue must come from the word of God. And brothers and sisters, if we fail to accept and embrace that, just look at what is happening to many folks. And we will see that all the things that we might try, all the approaches that we may pursue will lead to the same results if we don't first establish the word of God as the ultimate in terms of presentation on how relationship, marriages, family work. We must have that totally embraced and then we move to expand from there. So I'm happy that we have taken the, the time out to understand and if we didn't understand, to capture and to hold and to embrace that. We looked last week at a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And 
I, I just raised that because I want to link it to the other scripture that we raised last week that was taken from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 24 and verses 3 and 4. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter was talking to the saints and he said, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And you know, he went on, but he was saying that men, we ought to dwell with our wives according to knowledge. And so it is important that we understand that the things that we know about relationships is important because if we don't have the knowledge, then we cannot dwell with them according to knowledge. And Peter was saying to us who were in the church, talking to the men in particular here, that we must dwell with our wives according to knowledge. And therefore, it is obvious then that we must have knowledge. We see the same thing jumping out at us in Proverbs chapter number 24 and uh, verses 3 and 4. In fact, I might just put that on the screen for us if we are able to. But that was a very, um, very significant piece of scripture because it outlined that those that are going to build a house, those are, and remember we said at the start that the house can reflect a person's individual life, it can reflect a physical house, it can reflect a, 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 a marriage itself, it can reflect a nation, it can literally reflect the church. But when the wise man wrote, and was in this case reflect, and it could reflect any of those things, but in this case reflecting a relationship or a marriage, there were some things that were said that was very, very significant. And let us put it on the screen so that we can take our time and look together. It said, through wisdom is a house building, and by understanding it is established and by knowledge the same thing that peter mentioned in first peter chapter 3 and verse 7 that we must dwell with our wives according to knowledge here the wise man solomon is saying to those that are interested to build up a house that some things are important in the building of this house he started out by saying if we're going to build a house then we need wisdom the foundations are going to be established by understanding. And now he's saying in verse 4, And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant things. We did indicate um, last week that that word from which we got pleasant is a Hebrew word. And that word is name, N-A-E-M. It means sweet or comfortable or delightful. I might add today that the word precious is from another Hebrew word. And that word is yagar, Y-A-Q-A-R. It means valuable. It means rare. So that what we are observing from what the wise man Solomon is saying is that we, if we are going to build a house, if we are going to build a relationship, if we are going to build a family, and then if we, we recognize that if we are building a house, yes, the house is a structure and it has to, as we, just to use our colloquial expressions, we have to put the block and the steel and mix up everything for the thing to go up. He's saying that if we are going to set up that house in that form, we must have wisdom. Then he's saying if the house is going to, that beautiful house with the black and the steel and, and the cement and all of those things is going to go up and it is going to be anything of consequence, it must first have a proper, solid and sure foundation. And he's saying wisdom does the structure, the superstructure of the house. But he's saying understanding establishes the foundation of that house. And then after the house is established and a good foundation and the house is erected and then it is finished and it 
takes on architectural beauty. He is now saying if we are going to finish the house and have the house properly decked out with all the bathroom things and the bedrooms filled with the appropriate furnitures and furniture, sorry, and the, the, the nice things, the pictures and all the things that makes a home a beautiful place. He then goes on to say we have to have knowledge. By knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant things. So he's saying that for those precious and pleasant things, and we did say that precious means rare and valuable. We did say that pleasant means comfortable and delightful. So that when the house is built, if we are going to enjoy the atmosphere of the home, then there are some things that are going to be inside. Probably the rugs, probably the, the settee, the furniture, probably the, the, the hangings, the drapes, and the pictures, and, and, and the paintings, and all of those things. They all add to the beauty and the atmosphere, the tranquility of the home. What the wise man was saying is if we are going to have, whether it's a physical house that has things inside to make it beautiful and accommodating and a place where we want to run to, or if it is a relationship that is beautiful and that is sweet and that is alluring, if it is going to be worthwhile, if it is going to be attractive, if it is going to be somewhere where we want to run to be because the fragrance is lovely and the atmosphere is invaluable, if it is going to be somewhere that we want to cherish and that is pleasant and that is cheerful and that is beautiful, then he's saying that there are three pillars that are required to make it happen. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And if these things are absent, then we will not have a house that we want to live in. We will not have a relationship that is worth pursuing. And so for those that are in relationships and those that are married for one year or 30, 40 years, it doesn't matter because it is possible to be in the thing and not have understanding as to how to make the thing flow. If we don't have knowledge about relationship, if we don't know the construct of a man, if we don't know the construct of a woman, this is for the men, husband, we ought to know, we ought to have knowledge we ought to have understanding of the basic construct of a woman. How she thinks, how emotionally she operates. We ought to work with our spouses, men, according to knowledge. That is exactly what Peter said to the church and to the husbands back there, according to knowledge. If we don't have the knowledge, how are we going to work with them? If we don't have the knowledge, how is it going to happen? We must know how ladies flow, our wives flow. We must study and come to knowledge and understanding of how they operate, the things that make them bloom, the things that make them flourish, the things that make them excited, the things that make them want to run ahead and do the things that they were constructed to do. We must have knowledge. And the very same thing is true, ladies, as it relates to your husband. How does a man think? How does my husband think? How does he react to certain things? How does he operate under certain conditions? If we don't know those things, then it means we don't have the basic understanding, the basic knowledge that we can act upon so that we can know what to pull away from or what to run into so that we can know what steps to take or not to take. We, it is possible that we have been going through our relationship without any knowledge 
knowledge of each other, knowledge as to what is expected, knowledge as to what is to be given up, knowledge as to what is to be shared. We are just blank and we are going through this relationship thing on the basis of autopilot. If your thing is going through on autopilot, brothers and sisters, it is going to meet up in a wall sooner or later. We have to be deliberate. We have to take certain steps. We have to learn. We have to study. And then we have to act. If we don't do these things, Peter said it, and then Solomon said it. We must be wise. We must have knowledge and we must have understanding. These things take time to develop, but we must develop them. I've often said to folks, when we want to, to become a nurse or a doctor or a mechanic or any one of those things, we want to pursue a particular career. We take time out of all the other things that we are doing and we venture into a certain course of study. You study maths and English and, and biology, and for those who want to do accounts, study accounts, and all the things that are required so that you can perfect the particular area, career area that you want to venture into. We do that for everything that is worthwhile, that we put value on. Anything that we value, we make time. We create time, if we might use that term, so that we are clear on what it is that we are going into. We are clear on what is the things that are required. And we are clear in our minds that we are going to pursue this thing, even if it's the last thing that I do, because we place value. Some folks would do anything to get a Mercedes Benz, and they will spend a couple of millions of dollars to buy the best because they place value on it. And if it costs 10 million and they'll scrape to find it, they'll take the 10 million to buy the Benz because that means a lot to them. They place value on the Benz and will take 10 million and buy it. They probably wouldn't put that value on a ladder. No, but anything that we put value on, Whatever it costs, we will spend to get that thing because we value that thing. Can I ask a question to a lot of the persons who are married tonight? What value do you place on your relationship, your marriage? Ladies, what value do you place on your husbands? Husbands, what value do you place on your wives? Would you be willing if you could put a dollar value to this relationship or to your husband or your wife would he be like a Benz and you would spend 10 million dollars because you value him so much would she be like a BMW and you put 10 million dollars because you value her so much what would you be willing to spend on your relationship related to a car a ladder a mini that you, could, you, you don't want to spend too much money because you put little value on it. I believe many men and women at this time have placed so small a value on this thing known as relationship, on this thing known as marriage. And, and this is the thing that we should have been placing the most value on. Our marriages, our relationship, our husbands and our wives are valued and should mean more to us than even our careers. Sometimes people study and become doctors and after a while they change career and become business people and do a totally different thing. But you know that in our relationships it ought not to be so. We can't just change a re relationship like we change a career and say we're going to try something else. And yet, we would spend years and millions of dollars on, on a career or a car or a house because we value those things and yet spend so very little time even to buy a gift for our spouse. We, we count and, 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 and pick 
the little money to buy the thing because I don't want to buy that because it costs ten thousand dollars. But we would buy a we would buy we would buy an engine for a car for a hundred and don't squirm. But ten thousand is too much to buy a perfume. I want us to look again and to revalue what we place on our relationship, what we place on our husbands, and what we place on our wives as it relates to value and this easily comes around to this because we do have clear knowledge and understanding of what relationships are what they mean who our spouses are to us and what this institution called marriage is all about and i say that to the shame of all of us because we have come into this thing and we have covenanted with our partners and with God and we have never taken the time out to really understand who we have married and then to, 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 to study and to read and to know and to gain knowledge of our husbands or our wives we don't know have no clue but we married for 10 years and it's not going where it's supposed to go. And we say the man wicked or the woman wicked. And none of us don't know nothing. And according to Peter, according to Solomon, if we make the thing happen, we must have knowledge. Solomon went further and said understanding and wisdom. The question then is, what is wisdom? And I, a simple, 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 probably too basic but let's get down to basic simple definition the right use or the exercise of knowledge wisdom is the right right use of knowledge or the right exercise of knowledge because it is possible to know something and then we don't even know how to properly use it to benefit others to benefit ourselves so the one that is wise will have knowledge and understanding and then know how to properly rightly use the knowledge that is gained over time and we are called upon to be wise so wise men wise lady understand that when we talk about wisdom and we have been practical you now the practical part when we talk about wisdom we are talking about the right use or the right exercise of knowledge. Another way of putting it is seeing things as God sees them. Seeing things as God sees things. And this can only come when we have a good knowledge of the word of God. So our decisions, listen to this, our decisions and our actions are to be made in agreement with his will god's will and god's word that's what a wise man or a wise woman seeks to do when we are going to take action when we are going to make decisions we always try and endeavor to ensure that these actions, these decisions are in agreement with, are aligned to the will of God and the word of God. Those are traits that reflect a wise person. And Solomon said, if we're going to build a house, we must build it with by wisdom, we must be wise, know how to apply ourselves, know how to apply knowledge to specific situations so that our actions and our decisions at all times, as best as we can, is in agreement, is in alignment with the will of God and with the word of God. And if we find that we don't care what the word said, in wicked 
and we go and deal with him just like who he is. Be careful that you are not circumventing the word. It is not wise to circumvent the word, brothers and sisters. And the opposite of being wise and husbands, wives, if we circumvent the word, we are going to fall in the category of people who the Bible calls the opposite of being wise. And that person would be unwise, if I might use a more acceptable term. And you don't want to be in that group. So it is important to work in wisdom. And in a simple way, that is what wisdom is. Then it speaks about understanding. And understanding, remember now, we're just eating it in its simple form, as practical as we can be, to perceive with the mind. So we, we, we allow the thing to flow through our minds so that we become clear as to what is being said or what is being transmitted. So understanding, to understand is to perceive with the mind. To inquire in order to know. Yes? And to come to know about something very well. Any one of these definitions sums up what understanding is. To come to know. To perceive with the mind. Let it flow through the mind until we come to know. And to know a particular thing well. So that if we are going to have understanding as to the makeup of our spouse which is important if it's going to happen that our relationships work then we're going to take time we are going to make things flow through our mind we are going to meditate and think about what it is that we have found out that they like and they dislike what it is that we have found out about them that makes them shrivel up and become closed, the spirited, understanding, you know, takes in all of these things so that when we not only know, but, but come to understand and to know, but know very well, then we start to get a good handle of the things that we must or must not do so that we can enhance our relationship. Too many relationships are just going on and folks don't care to take the time out to, to understand who their spouse is. Not just as the individual, although that is crucial and that is a must, but the broader male. How are males built up? How are females built up? What are the things that will cause a male to become frantic and frightened? As opposed to what are the things that will cause a female to become frightened? We will recognize if we take the time out to study and to come to understanding that a male and a female, although they look alike in terms of in the image of God, with, you know, in terms of their intellectual capacities and capabilities, in terms of their ability to reason and to think high above the animal kingdom. Yes, that part of them are, are alike. They, physically, they are alike in many respects. They have two hands. They have ten fingers. They have two feet. They have ten toes together. Yes, all both male and female have one nose. And, 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 and a pair of lips, and a pair of eyes, and a pair of ears. And there are many similarities. But, brothers and sisters, the build-up and construct of a man is totally different from that of a woman. The things that will cause a man to, to, to run and to jump and to get excited is totally different from the things that will cause a woman to run and to jump and to get excited. And sometimes we miss this basic understanding. And therefore, if a husband don't react a certain way to a particular situation, it is easy for a wife to say he's cold and he's hard and he's difficult and he's wicked. And at the same time, if a lady react 
with a certain level of emotional whatever the term is a man might be quick to say she's so crazy and she make nice for every little thing and she talk and talk and talk ladies were made a totally different way from men and so it is important if we are going to flow together as husbands and wives it is important men that we understand that we take time out and gain knowledge so that we can put the knowledge and the understanding together and apply it because the applied knowledge is what is wisdom and we can therefore be wise in how we deal with our wives she scream at a roach or a lizard and a man get upset and says she's stupid and yet she was built to be emotional so that little things that you as a man would box aside she scream and run away from she's not stupid that's how generally ladies react in terms of their emotional reaction that is how they move they were built with a higher emotional caution than us as men so you can't beat down a lady for screaming or for talking if you want a wife that don't talk men maybe you're talking that you want a man and no man must want a man men must marry be married to ladies that's how it was from the beginning and if a lady come men she is going to talk she is going to be emotional so you cannot stop her from being emotional because that is how she was built knowledge and understanding will allow us to appreciate this and therefore it dictates to us how we then deal with them because we have the knowledge ladies husbands men take time to process things and to do things men don't normally jump from lizard and cockroach so if you scream and he's and he stands up there and seem to be nonchalant as, as if he doesn't care it's not that he doesn't care it is that he does not react to certain things in the way that you react to it so many times ladies when you call your husband cold and uncalculating and don't care and have no empathy that's not so maybe it's the media because as a man he sees himself or is was built in a particular way and this is not suggesting that men are not emotional neither am i suggesting that all ladies will make this shout at the same decibel but in a general way ladies are much more emotional than men and therefore react to things in a certain way and men are more cooler and calmer in their response and reaction to other things if we don't take time out to study the, the build up the construct the anatomy of a man or the anatomy of a woman and, and anatomy tends to have a physical connotation but i want us to put the an anatomy to take in physical and yes and emotional and social and mental all together because we can learn how men operate we can learn how ladies operate under varying conditions and we would be surprised at what we find out and therefore become less critical of our spouses because have you ever taken time out and wonder and you hear you listen to how ladies in general talk about their husbands are men and if you're not careful you get the feeling that all men are well seem to have the same traits or characteristics but then does that strike you as being odd that certain things it seem common to men 
And men, you talk about ladies, and you're in your little group, your little male group, having your man talk. You ever hear the, the wives being spoken about? And I hope you're not disrespectful in your talking about your wives and ladies, you know. You have some wicked men that talk about how their wives are wicked and and etc 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 get that those kind of conversations out of your vocabulary words go around and you'll be surprised what happens and vice versa but you ever hear men talking nicely about their wives and doesn't it not strike us that there seem to be a commonality among ladies it is suggesting that ladies have a certain way about them because they were built a certain way and men likewise have a certain way about them because they were built a certain way and it is time enough for us to come to the understanding that we are built differently we act differently to certain circumstances we act differently to certain situations and we have got to learn who our spouses are and work with them based on that if there are ways that they have that needs to be addressed we will address that later on but there are some fundamental things that are common to men and more peculiar to our spouses and we need to find these things and understand them a lady is so emotional so when she's down if she go to a girlfriend the girlfriend just hold her and cry with her and 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 empathize with her in a way that she feel that this person understand but if she go to her husband if not going to cry with her that way and then she says cold he might not be cold at all but that is how men tend to respond in many instances and many men have fallen short and where we fall short we must make up so that we can as best as we can express ourselves but don't expect a man to comfort you in the same way that a lady friend comforts you because men are not women and likewise men don't expect your wife to operate and and jump and do the thing that your brethren will do for you because ladies are not men and we must understand and appreciate that no it is important too many relationships and marriages have gone awry because we fail to take the time out to learn and to understand and to come to knowledge as to how we are made up and therefore what to expect. Our expectations of men are in many instances expecting them to be like women and men are not. And our expectations of our wives are that we are expecting them to treat us like our brethren as if they are men and they are not and we need to become wise and how do we get wise by how much we take time out to come to knowledge of things and get the full understanding so that we can apply knowledge and understanding and the applied knowledge and understanding is what is known as wisdom. It is time for us to wise up. We have carried our relationships for too long and caused it to be in disrepair because we have taken some things for granted. It is time to wise up. And so we are going to move to the next part of what I want to talk to us about. So I spent some time before talking to the men. And we're going to come back to the men. We'll finish with the men because the responsibility is upon us. Um, I have to spend more time with the men. But we want to spend some time with the ladies. And I want us to be balanced. Very important. You realize, brothers and sisters, that when God through his apostles gave instructions and said to the husband, husband, love your wife even as Christ loved the church. And then he moved on to say, wives, 
be in subjection to your own husbands. And it went on. Have we ever taken the time out and looked deeply at the things that were requested, both from the husband and from the wife? In both instances, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and give himself for it. And then wives, be in submission, subjection or submission to your own husbands. And in another scripture it says, as you do this, you're doing it in subjection to your husband as unto the Lord. You realize that none of them give any connotation as being a demand. None of them demanded anything from anybody. Both commands, both to the husband and to the wife, in both instances, it was an act of service. We're I have found that in relationships, marriages, and this is why I want us to have the Bible as our focus, because when the, the Lord, through the writer, said to the husband to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, it was a sacrifice that he was being called upon to give for his wife. There wasn't any demand. And when a wife is required to be in subjection in, to her own husband, she is being called upon like him to give. It's not a demand because she has other things that she wants to reach out to. She has her own thing that she wants to accomplish and not that she is not going to accomplish them. But here the biblical standard, wives, be submissive to your own husbands. And we're going to explain what that is. But in both instances, they are acts of service. And a husband will have to willingly sacrifice even to death, so to speak, for his wife. And the wife is going to willingly yield to her husband. Both of them are acts of service. No demands were being made. So this thing where I demand him to do this or I demand her to do that. Once we start off along that line, and I want us to take it calmly and just look at it. We have to be careful how we are making demands on each other. Because intrinsically, this thing is us serving each other and I want us to pause and recognize that what is being requested or required of us is that we serve each other the husband's, the husband's service is one where he's going to have to make sacrifices for his wife that's serving the wife is where she's going to yield some time her own will to allow for the headship, the established headship, based on how God ordained the thing, to flow. And that is an act of her will. And that is her giving up something so that the program flow. That is service. So you're both called upon Husbands and wives, we are both called upon not to make demands, but to give service. It is the heart of making the thing happen. What will I do for her? What will I do for him? To make him happy and to make her happy. It is a call, brothers and sisters, to serve. Don't look over that fact. And I want us to be very, very clear on that. So, having said all that I've said so far, I'm going to come now to a very ticklish part with this Bible. 
and I was not afraid to tell men to take up their roles as men and their responsibility. I was not afraid and I was not shy to tell our men that the burden of responsibility is on our shoulders and we must be men. The Bible declare it and I will, would not have shunned from saying and we will look at the scripture, other scriptures in a little while. But the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. There's nothing derogatory about that. There's nothing derogatory about Christ being the head of the church. In fact, we love that. We love that order. That is the order that God established. And it is the same way that is applied to the husband and to the wife. Not in a demeaning, derogatory way. As some folks would make it out to be. It is not. And we want to emphasize that point. It is spiritual. It is going in accordance with the order that the Lord established. And if the church functions in the way that it is set to function, then the marriage relationship is going to function in a similar way. And if we can't grasp that concept, we are going to be in a little pickle. So I want us now to take time out and turn again. Because as we said last week, we can look at one scripture. We can look at one scripture and gain or glean so much from it. And one scripture can talk about a number of things. This evening, we go back to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 5. Let's turn to Ephesians 5 and we're going to read a couple of verses. Um, let's put it on the screen. Ephesians chapter number 5. I We go from verse twenty. Two, and we go down. Ephesians chapter number 5. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I want us to mark that part that says as unto the Lord. Very important. Because many times we read the thing and we leave out that part. But that part is very, very, very significant. And I want us to be clear in our minds where that is concerned. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, let's just pause a little bit because we're going to read further down. And as I said earlier, we took time the other, a few weeks ago and I focused on the men. And I want us to focus some attention on the ladies now because there is this thing that being submissive and being subject in subjection to your husband there is this thing that it, it speaks to a kind of slavery thing or that the wives now take a, a secondary role um, in the household and so forth and so forth but we want to go through because we want to establish that that is certainly not the case at all and the bible tells us um about this and goes on to explain and there are scriptures both in new testament and old testament that let us you know come to an understanding when we talk about submission so submission does not signify that a wife is inferior to her husband. Men and women have equal worth in God's eyes. And uh, Peter said that in the very scripture that we started off with earlier in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. He dealt with that, right? It spoke to us having, being together, being the hearers 
of salvation. And so where God is concerned, man or woman, husband or wife, doesn't matter. Together we have the same standing as it comes uh, to our salvation and how God sees us and our worth. So when we speak about submission, we are not at all talking or signifying or suggesting that the wife is inferior to the husband. Mentally, when we look at women today and way back, we find out that in terms of the mental capacity, in terms of potential, outside of physical potential, because physically they are different. And the Bible speaks about the weaker vessel, and it is a weaker vessel physically. And that's a fact. Even today, science has proven and shown that physically, women are weaker than men. And so, as the weaker vessel physically, certain things are there. But when, it, when we speak about our mental capacity, you know, our potential to do certain things, the worth of a woman, uh, the worth of a man, no, no we are, ladies are not secondary or inferior when it comes to this, so that the term submission and submitting does not in any way, certainly not the biblical term, suggest that a woman is a slave to a man or is inferior. And in the church, there are men that believe that mistaken notion that when the Bible said that the woman must submit to the man, it is because she is to be his helper. For didn't Genesis say she was made his helpmeet, and therefore she is his helper. That's why from the beginning, women cook and them wash. And they, no, it didn't say that she was our helper. A helper is somebody who cook and wash and clean and etc. etc. She was not our helper, but our helpmeet. It means our support. And we are going to define that as we go on so that we become clear in our minds that we are not talking about a helper, which is somebody who does things for us simply so that we have life easy. No, it is our helpmeet, the person who was given to us as men to support us in our quest, our God to reach and to attain to our God given mandate so god put eve to support adam so that he and her with him could achieve and accomplish that which god mandated them to do yes he made man to be the leader and we will see that as we go through scripture but that leadership does not mean a master and slave but one where the wife the spouse is the person that God put there to help him in achieving and attaining to the potential that God wants him and then them to reach. So we need to see that in the right perspective. And so the wife is not relegated in any way to any inferior position of servitude that denies her gifts and abilities. Many wives have testified and can testify that even as they give support to their husbands, they themselves still move to achieve and to attain their gifts and their goals and, 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 and bring into fruition their God-given abilities. So being submissive according to scriptures is not denying women, wives, of their ability which God gave to them and if God gives you an ability he expects you to make the best but it has a totally different meaning when God refers to submission he is talking about the carrying out of a divinely ordained program which in this case is the home and a home is not desired are designed to be functioning with two heads just as a human body is not meant to have two heads just as, as the church is not made 
are meant to have two heads. The Bible said the head of the church is Christ. One head. The head of the wife is the husband. One head. So that when we therefore talk about submission, and I go it over, as I, I reiterate it, God is talking about the carrying out of a divinely ordained program. Something that he has put in place. And remember we said at the very beginning that God is the one that ordained marriage. And he has a program for marriage. And he ordained it. And in this case, it is to have godly homes. A home is not designed to function. Brothers and sisters, with two heads. Nope. Just as the human body is not made to have two heads, just as the church is not made to have two heads, the husband and the wife, the relationship that comes together in marriage, the home that ensued must have one head. And God, in his wisdom, and by his design, organized it so that the man is the head of the wife. And that being so, God gave the man certain responsibilities. And his responsibility is heavy. And if he is going to carry out that God-given responsibility as the head, as the, the person designed to lead the family unit to lead the relationship then he is going to have to have the full support of his wife and god sectionalized the thing in such a way that the husband must love the wife as christ loved the church and gave his life for his church so that the, for, for the thing to happen the man must sacrifice like nothing he must sacrifice everything and then the wife seeing this sacrifice is going to now follow the ordained plan of god to be submissive and to be in subjection to her husband headship and leadership they go together it is not a case where the wife becomes subservient and therefore carry out the whims and fancy of her husband no 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 it is that under God, and this is why you now, if we are not at the place spiritually to appreciate what God has designed and the program that God has, we are going to miss the boat when it comes to how relationships should work and function. Do not, I reiterate, do not let the world impose its standards upon you child of god that this is how marriages work it is the bible that is the authority on marriage marriage was ordained by god and it is the bible the book that is the authority so that if the bible says that this is the program of god and god placed the christ as the head of the church god as the head of christ the husband as the head of the wife, as the head of the wife, then this is by design, by heaven's design, and we must not allow men, whoever they are, men that are ungodly, that don't know this book, we must not let the world or the culture dictate to us what God has outlined clearly in his word as it relates to his design for marriage and his design for the home and his design for relationship. We must follow the word, even if it's so hard. So the men took me to task the other day when I put his square on their shoulders and the ladies said, they're going to pray for me. And I, I asked the ladies, please still pray for me, even as we go through this part. So therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ and we gladly follow because we recognize that he has that 
leadership authority over the church and therefore we gladly submit and follow the Lord. The verse is now saying, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything, in other words, in every sphere of the marriage. Now we're going to come to some things, you know, because this thing is deep. And the questions, I can see them coming through the camera already. But I, I, I am married to him and, and he, he, he doesn't even have all levels. And I have my degree. Of course you have your degree and you knew that when you got married to him. Of course he doesn't have his own level and you knew that when you got married to him. So now that you're married, are you saying that your degree is going to trump the word of God? No. Are you suggesting that because you have a higher paying job, it is going to trump what is written in the word of God? No. Are you suggesting that because you're able to rationalize better and reason better by virtue, virtue of your educational attainment that it is going to trump the design of God that is outlined in the word? No. That is not going to happen. That is not supposed to happen. And so even as the questions come, we will have time when we are going to dissect the thing and show how we can make the thing work. Remember we said, you know, the message cannot change. Methods will change and forms will change and approaches will change. But the message, the word, the foundational things, brothers and sisters, cannot change and should not change. And it is very, very, very important that we understand that so that when ephesians 5 24 says so let the wives be to their own husbands in every area in everything don't think the bible don't know what it is talking about the bible knows let us not put to even our own personal private interpretation on the thing because no people going to say let me get all the the different translations because King James don't have it right. But brothers and sisters, King James have it right. Because I have read it in NIV. I have read it in the TLV. I have read it in different translations. It is all saying the same thing. It's just that in our Western culture, we don't want to accept it. Let me tell us what is at play. Let me tell us what is at play here. And we must be careful let me tell us what is at play here and i want us to be very very careful i want look do not let god's word be put under because of what people say and what society is dictating there are a group of persons that will tell us that look and they have come to us and they have indicated that look where the Bible talks about. And they have made a big issue of it, you know. And I want us to know. And I want to bring to our attention. Because at no time is the Bible. And I took pains a while ago to explain that submission does not have anything to do. And, and being submissive to your husband has nothing to do with a master-slave arrangement. Absolutely nothing. Let us erase that from our thinking, from our mindset. Men, if that was ever in our minds because of what our great-grandfathers or any men in the past told us, erase that. No. I am telling you that that is not the case. The Bible did not intend for that and never suggested that, and that is not the case. Nor did the Bible say God gave Adam a helper. Erase that. But one of the things I know that have caused the negative mindset and for antennas to be raised when it comes to women is that there are things that have been coming out from different corners of or society, and when I say society, I'm not just talking about the Jamaican society, but I'm talking across the nations of the world. Because there is a move to reverse certain order. And you, you would have heard me saying that 
in times past. There is a move to, re to reverse the order that was established uh, from way back from the beginning. I mentioned before that there is a move where marriages are concerned. They are, they are, they are, they are trying to annul marriage, to, to, to say that you don't have to get married. When God instituted it, and from the beginning he said a man and a woman, it's being reversed. Where they are saying a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. The, the thing is being, there's a great reversal taking place. God made female, male and female, created he them. There is a reversal. And now it is being pushed right across the globe that we must forget about gender. There should be no gender bias. So if a person don't want to be a female and they want to be a male, they can change to be a male and a male can be a female. And if they don't want to be a male or a female, there's a new section or a new category that is being devised. And a person can put themselves in that slot and nobody can discriminate against them. There's a reversal, a great reversal is taking place. So that now in certain parts of the world you can go into bathroom. You don't have a female bathroom or a male bathroom again. It's just a bathroom. And male and female use it. And if you ever try to make a complaint or do something, you get into trouble. The great reversal. It is the same thing that is happening even in the order that God has established. In the home, in marriages. Because the scriptures that we have just read in Ephesians 5 are clear. No going around it. They are not meant to discriminate. They are not meant to demean. But they are meant to go and to follow a certain order that God established. And he did this by design from the beginning. And yet Christian ladies are up in arms. Because they are saying, I, I will not submit to my husband. And I am more sensible than him. And, and not only that, look at the world. The world has changed. This thing where men are in charge, that's not there again. Well, it's still in the Bible. And when I say in charge, in the context of the Bible, and the design that God has made, it is still there. And so I am not just speaking to the peoples of the world now. I am talking to Christians who clap their hands and say, I am a part of the family of God. And I challenge anyone that claims to be a Christian, and claims to read the Bible and decide that they want to follow Jesus and use the Bible as their guidebook. I challenge you to, to tear these pages out or to give a different meaning to them. You cannot. I cannot. And I'll be brave enough to submit to the ladies that it is a principle. It is by design that God has done this thing. And it is unchangeable. And we circumvent the word of God to our own destruction and to our own hurt. Many families are hurting right now because wives are unable to accept and to yield to their husband headship of the home. And that is a fact. And it doesn't matter how bigger job you have ladies it doesn't matter how much money you earn ladies money does not give you the authority to change and to reverse the role that God established by design and we will see that if we change this thing it causes a problem you remember we read from the book of Genesis I will not go back to it just now in terms of bringing it up on the screen or having us to read it but one of the things we looked at or we might not have looked at this part but going back to Genesis chapter 2 we find that God spoke to Adam and told Adam not to eat of a particular fruit yes he was given the responsibility and we have gone through that already but notice that something happened Eve reversed the established order because God told Adam don't do this Eve knew what God told Adam and together they were there and then the serpent came and tempted Eve 
it was not Eve decision to make let us say she was even beguiled and she she desired the thing you know what eve should have done oh satan this thing looks good give me a moment adam i know god said not to eat this but look here see something come what wasn't revealed come we could just try it now adam no no the order was reversed. The headship was not acknowledged. Eve reversed the order. Eve ate it. And having done that, she now go to her husband and make Adam to eat it too. But she eat it without going to him, without any order, without following through on anything, without acknowledging the established order. For something as major as that. Because that was major. That was huge, brothers and sisters. That was a big event. And they were no married. And no communication at that time. And she took the decision to defy the order not to eat. And she eat first. And then go to the husband, having done the wrong. She reversed the order. That reversal was very significant. Because everything that followed, the disharmony, the curse, the child-bearing pain, everything that followed had something to do with her reversing the order and eating of the food. Be careful, brothers and sisters, how we try to circumvent. Be careful, ladies. Tonight is ladies' night. How we try to circumvent and go around the established order, the established word of Almighty God. Be careful how we circumvent and try to go around. We will invite some consequences that we don't want to have, that we never envisage. I say this in a, in a spirit of love, you know, because sometimes we don't know what exactly it is that we're doing. We get caught up in what is happening in the culture of the day. So the folks are saying, we reject ladies, and these are some feminine associations. We reject ladies talking about they are going to submit to their husbands. We are not slaves. We are not second class citizens, is how they term it. So they have now presented the thing in a way, subtly saying, by being submissive to your husbands, as Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 and other scriptures put it, by being submissive according to the plan and the design and the purpose of God, by being submissive, it is making ladies into second class citizens. That's a lie. But those are the terms that are being used in a subtle way. To let it appear that you are now becoming slaves and you are becoming se second class citizens in your country and you are becoming se second class citizens at your home. That is not so. And I submit to us. And if we dare to change the order, as many folks have, as many ladies have, we will find that happiness in our relationships will be an elusive dream. If we fail to follow the order and work in the program and embrace the design of Almighty God, the author of marriage, if we fail to follow his principles, we are inviting trouble. And let me tell us, when we breach and break and defy 
what God has clearly outlined in his word and dare to change the order, we invite an element in our relationship that we never bargained for. Because to change the order and to defy the leadership role that God has given our husband is an act of rebellion. And rebellion is from the word rebel, which is a characteristic of Satan. We don't know what we are doing when we defy the word and we don't follow suit with the basic principles of family life. And by defying the headship of the husband and his role as leader of the household, we are defying the word of God. And ladies, you will not have the support of God because he does not support rebellion. And that's, that those are serious words, but they are facts, factual words. He does not support rebellion. And many ladies are can't understand why up to now, after so many years of marriage, it is just so rough and it's just tumbling and it's just not happening. And we're not realizing that we, and since we're talking about the ladies, so we're talking about submission now and we have a little way to go. Probably not tonight, but we have a little way to go. It is important that we understand that we introduce into our relationship a door for the enemy to push his head in and to cause mayhem and turmoil and, and unhappiness. Let's just go according to the simple way and the simple word of Almighty God. So we just read verse 24. Um, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25. Let's put it up on the screen and read a little bit more. The time is going and we have a few things to say. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet, and we're talking about it, or ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones now i want us to bear in mind when he talk about we are members of his body it is important that we get this concept the body as we know it has one a head but yet the head and the body together work as one being and it is important that we see that i'm going to apply it to the husband and wife and show us how very important it is that we understand the concept and then we continue from there the body with the head the neck the arms the feet everything work together as one structure one being very very important that we grasp and that we understand that. But what we have found happening is in the marriage relationship, if we decide that we don't want anymore to acknowledge the head, if we decide that we no longer want to 
acknowledge the role of leadership. If we decide that we are not going to be, ladies now, submissive and work together with our husbands, recognizing, understanding, and working with his role given to him by God as the head, let me tell us what is going to happen. Look at what happens with the human body. Look at what happens in the church. And then look at what's going to happen in our relationship. So with the human body, the head, the rest of the body, we're all together, one being. If I want to move my right hand, I can move it. If I want to move my left hand, I can move it. You know how this happens? The head, through the brain, gives a signal and it sends information through nerve and nerve endings. And my right hand, which is a part of the body, follows the dictates of the head. And we can move it. It's the same principle in the church with Christ being the head. He sends out. He indicates. He passes on. He sends a word. And the body receives it. And just like he did in Revelation, he, he might simply say, I have somewhat against you because you have not been doing it. And the head speaking. And then the body moves to put, them, to put herself in place with what is coming from the head. The head is the central system. The head is where the movement takes place in terms of you know, what is to happen because of the position of leadership and headship. Now, when it comes to the family, to the husband and wife, the principle is the same. The God has given the husband that responsibility and that role. The role of being submissive to our husbands, we made it clear it has nothing to do with master-slave. It has nothing to do with second-class citizens. It has nothing to do with you being subservient. Absolutely nothing. But it has everything to do with the wife following the principles and the pattern and the design of Almighty God. And in the same way, the head and the body in the human being works, where the head is the central nervous system. It controls the activities of everything else. The same way in the church, Christ who is the head controls the activities within the church. It is the same way in the family because we have already shown where the church and the husband and wife relationship reflects each other. And the headship given there, that's in the husband and wife, and the role of the wife in working with the husband and yielding to him because God has arranged it that way, is what is required for a smooth flow and for a harmonious relationship to take place. Can a wife talk to her husband and relate to him and make suggestions to him? Yes! And if that doesn't happen, it's not going to work. Being in charge does not mean that a wife cannot put the points out and lay her position on the table. Because husbands and wives, based on what we see and what we saw over there in Genesis, they sat together and together Adam and Eve had dominion. They ruled together and had dominion. And Adam reflected the glory of God. He reflected the glory of Adam, which ultimately she still reflected the glory of God. But they ruled and they reigned and they had dominion together. It is still a together thing. So this is not something where the husband, because he is the head, gives his edict. And that is it. No. Just by virtue of how we see coming right through the Bible, there has to be time when there is dialogue and when there is talk and when there is sharing and out of that and, and most relationships where it flows and where it works, where wives recognize the due headship and authority of the husband as the head of the house. In relationships where they work, you look at them, you inquire, there is always dialogue, there is always sharing. There is always communication. 
when decisions are to be made because it impacts everybody there is dialogue there comes times however when there is a stalemate and if there is a stalemate if there is a time when it is gridlocked and a decision has to be made wives yield to your husband even if you think it's the wrong decision that will flow somebody must yield the bible says you and i'm giving you a scripture i'm not going around the bush and i'm not going around the corner i'm not joining a men's group and i'm not in favor of you taking the position of the women's labor or anything like that this has nothing to do with associations or anything like that this is just straight the word of god i told the men to take their responsibilities seriously and challenge them and there are some that were an embarrassment to men and i call it out to them and i'm saying the same thing to the ladies tonight that it is important that we understand that the word of god is still in force today and we must yield even if it turns out that he is wrong if it is that the husband because he has that responsibility and authority to say honey you go with this what you think i'll go with what you say and if you say a and he say you go with a fine fine that's different and husbands if she say a and you go with a and it turned out to be the wrong thing don't take her up on it and blame her because you gave her the latitude because you have that authority so you cannot now turn around and say, see you make the decision and it go wrong. You, you gave her that latitude because there was a gridlock and you gave her that latitude. And if it was a wrong decision, you both live with it, build from there and move on again. But the principle is, never forget that in keeping harmony in the relationship, the husband was given the responsibility yes the husband was given the responsibility and we cannot get away from that and we cannot get around that so i want us to be very 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 careful and to bear that in mind i want us to turn to first peter chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 i'm going to close now because i realize at the time and we're not going to go beyond i'm going to close now but quickly let us turn to first peter chapter 3 uh, verses 1 and 2 Let's put it on the screen. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye, wa ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also, uh, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wife or the man of the way of living of the wives right verse 2 while they behold your chaste conversation or your chaste way of living coupled with fear in other words as they observe your chaste and respectful attitude or behavior now this is very significant this is very significant there are two concepts of submission and respect here outlined very important respectful behavior or respectful attitude and the chaste manner of life two things very significant god is suggesting and, and this is where ladies have power now a lot of ladies don't realize and recognize the the power that they have as ladies because look what god is now doing while the man was given the, the position of authority while the man is called upon to love and to make the sacrifice even unto death for his wife the ladies now are asked to 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 be yielded to their husbands you know to submit to their husbands to yield to their husband but it, it it goes on in first peter that we just read to say look here do it 
Because there is something in it now that you don't know that will only happen if you are submissive or if you are chaste and respectful in your attitude even to your husband if he's unsaved or if he's not steeped in the word. Did you know, ladies, that by the kind of treatment that you meet out to your husband, even an unsaved husband, you don't have to preach one word of the gospel to him. But by way of how you maintain your position as his wife and maintain a behavior or an attitude that is chaste and respectful, because that is what First Peter 3 verse 2 is saying, then you can literally win that person over. If he's unsaved, you can win him to the Lord. And he might be saved, but he might not even be walking in the word as he ought. We are not called upon, ladies, you are not called upon to say if he's doing his job as the head of the house and as the priest of the house, then I will submit to him. But if he's not doing his job as the head of the house or the priest of the house, I will not. No. The Bible said to the husband, love your wives. There was no condition. So it means that if you husbands even feel that, boy, I don't feel to love her you know, because some things what she do and some things what she didn't do and a whole lot of things come to our minds and I just care and love. No, it was unconditional. Husbands, love your wives. If she's late with dinner, husbands, love your wives. If she don't cook none at all, husbands, love your wives. We have other sessions to deal with those things. Don't worry about it. But I'm just saying, according to scripture, it is unconditional. Husbands, love your wives. In fact, as Christ gave his life for the church, so you must love your wife. For me, you're going to sacrifice to the utmost for her. Unconditionally. Not if she's nice and, and, and give you dinner every evening and all the nice things. Then you will love her. Nope. It is unconditional. It is the same way, ladies. When the Bible says, wives, be in submission to your own husband. Yield to your own husband it is not when he's playing the role of a good husband or that he's a good priest nope in the same way how he must love you unconditionally it is in the same way and light that you must yield to him unconditionally and that is bible and so i want us to understand that this is what the scripture is saying. Peter called it chaste and respectful behavior or attitude. And it basically involves a wife's godly attitude that can draw an unbelieving husband to Christ without her having to preach one sermon to him or to continually criticize his lifestyle. Or some wives to pin Bible verse on the pillow when they wake up in the morning and see this big thing. Seek the Lord or, 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 or serve the Lord or die. If you look at some things what some wives do to, to try to get the attention of their husband to either to serve God. Uh, God, Jesus, the Bible said, no, 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 no. You don't have to do none of those things. Just follow through. And this is why I'm saying to us, you know, if we but follow the Bible, look at what some folks have been doing for years and years later. It don't work. It means that it is not workable. Why don't we at least try to follow through on the basic principles of that, that is in the Bible? Yeah, by our, and when I say, oh, I'm talking to the ladies, chaste and respectful attitude, even the husband that doesn't deserve that kind of attitude and chaste manner, rhythm, he is going to see it, believe it or not, because the Bible says, and he might very well be, brought over to Christ or be drawn back into a deep relationship with Christ because of the life that you choose to live. God has invested that kind of power into the wife, the power of yielding to your husband. 
that can win and save without you preaching one word. There is a message in that all by itself, and that is written in the word of God. And we fail to see it. We think it better if we, we beat him over and we get up every morning and we nag him and we tell him this and we remind him of this and God is going to get you if you don't. No, no, no. We don't need to do that. We just let us take our time and let us take our and, and let us be patient and take our own time and go through and you will be surprised what can be accomplished the biblical doctrine of submission you know have nothing to do with how much clothes a wife brings to the table as opposed to her husband or who is a stronger one in terms of personality to submit is simply to recognize that god has given the wife the yield sign just yield. you know when you come to a roundabout you see a little triangular looking sign that says yield. No, it's not like a stop sign no, that says you better stop. Because you know that yield is an act of the will. So although God puts it here and expects us to follow his word and yield, we don't have to do it. But to what extent, at what cost? The yield sign is right there on that roundabout. And if we dare to just drive by and say another vehicle coming out with this sign, so we're not going to yield, we don't have to. But there's going to be a collision. All we had to do was to yield. And to yield is just simply to, 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 to give way to the person who is already on the roundabout. To yield, ladies, is to give way to the person who God has already given the, you know, the authority, the, the position of leadership to do things according to his plan. So you're just yielding like the man on the roundabout that is already on the roundabout. And you yield because by law he's already there. By God's design, the man is already there, so by, you just have to yield. It is simply that, you know, we make a big thing out of it, but it's really not a big thing. It is an important thing. It is a significant thing. It is in the word, but we somehow wrongly associate yielding with being second-rated and, 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 and second-class, and it has absolutely nothing to do with God. Submission has to do with function and not to who you are. It's not a matter of who you be. It's not a matter of being. It is a matter of function. It is the man's function as the head to do certain things. When you yield, that submission is simply a function. He's already on the roundabout. And so you submit, you yield to allow him to do what God has programmed and designed him to do. And then you now take your rightful place and give him the full support and 100 support as he is supposed to, to actually have. Right? I'm going to close now. I actually close now. Um, we pick up on Proverbs chapter 31 next week because we are going to show you who a real woman of God is. The Bible calls her a virtuous woman. You're going to see that she is no push over you're going to see that she is no body that stands on the sideline yes but you're going to see that she's somebody that is well known and that suggests that you know her husband benefits from her wife's ministry from his wife's ministry you're going to see that she's not somebody that just sit around and wait and is passive and is mindless you know, she can't think and she just wait for anything her husband says she do because she's submissive. No, no, no. That's, that's not the virtuous woman. That was never the intent of the Bible. So we find that this lady, she, she conducts business and she meets with the merchants and she gets and she buys and she sells. Yes? And then she, she, she does um, real estate because she buys property. And she takes care of the finances of her house. And she takes care of those that work in the house that makes things happen. And she oversees the well-being of her house. The same uh, um, Proverbs 31 says her husband is known, clearly linking his being known to the work that this virtuous, virtuous woman does. So that she is instrumental in him being known and him being seen. 
So this is not somebody who is passive and just sit on there waiting for instructions from her husband. This is somebody who is active and is a go-getter and has her abilities and work within her abilities and therefore her husband now propels her on. But when the time comes and she knows what her functions and responsibilities are and she knows as a virtuous woman what his functions and responsibilities are and she knows when to push him and she knows when to lift him and she knows when to yield a virtuous we won't talk about her and you will see that this thing about submission that means you're second class citizen you are not and yet ladies you're required to yield to your husband because this is what the bible requires of you in the same way that it requires of him as the head to do certain things so that there can be harmony and there can be proper synchronism and working i submit to us that many marriages are in turmoil because we don't understand the rules. We don't understand what headship is. We don't understand what submission is. So we think all kinds of other things. And once we are outside of the program of God, once we are outside of what God has designed, even if we didn't know, my people according to Hosea is destroyed because of lack of knowledge, I challenge us to push and to take on the responsibility to get knowledge and to get understanding so that we can apply this knowledge and understanding, apply it in the practical realm, which is wisdom. And we will see that it can be applied to every aspect of our relationship so that we can build a good house with solid foundation and beautiful interior decoration. I know, brothers and sisters, that this thing can work. I'm going to tell us a little bit about um, the wife of this man in the Old Testament scriptures in 1 Samuel chapter number 25. I believe her name was Abigail. And Abigail was a precious lady. And she nevertheless had a husband who was rough and coarse and David was going to kill him. And Abigail had to step in. And she was like a soother in the midst of something. She showed respect to her husband. And I'm going to show you what that does. You're going to find out that even Sarah, who laughed at Abraham and laughed at the angel, showed respect and yielded. And you're going to see, because Hebrews 11, verse 11, spoke about Sarah, that by faith she received the promise. A lot of people think Sarah never received the promise, you know, and that she was just a daughter. She doubted, yes, which naturally many folks would. But it, if we didn't see Hebrews 11 verse 11, we would realize that Sarah had in fact by faith received it. So she submitted and yielded to the, prophets, to the prophecy. And therefore she submitted and yielded both to Abraham and to the angel. And we are going to see that the principle is just there in Old Testament time and right in the scriptures that we are talking about. But we have got to accept it. We have got to be holy women leaning heavily on the word and if we dare to walk according to the word which is the manual for marriage i am telling us it is not going to be as it is for many of us but we have just got to do what we have got to do so we started with the ladies and we just touched a little bit and then we go into some more on the ladies and i'm not picking on the ladies because i never pick on the men i just talk straight from the word of god and i'm doing the same for the ladies tonight but it is important. Take time and read Ephesians 5, 22 down again tonight, ladies. Take time and read First Peter. Uh, First Peter 3, 1 to 2 again, ladies. Take time and just, just, just let us go through it. First Peter 3, 1 to 2. Take time and read them. And we're going to go through some, go through some more scriptures. And we are going to see that we're not talking about anything that is old-fashioned. We are not talking about anything that is out of vogue. The principles of God, the design of God are there for us and they are unchangeable. The methods will change, methodologies, methodologies will change, approaches will change, things will change with the times. But the word of God, the principle of God, how God establishes plans, the things that God has put in place, he has a reason because he has done these things by design from way back. 
and we have to just flow with what God has in store for us and what God has shown us. And so we stop here for the night. God bless you. God's willing, we pick up next week and we continue with submission and what it really means and how it can easily be done. And there is power in a wife that is submissive. And we will show that in this, as we, as we will see in this story with Abigail. God bless you. We close for this evening. And God's willing, uh, life spared, Jesus tarries. We meet again next week and we pick up from where we have stopped tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let's just bow our heads for prayer. Father, we come again and we say thank you for your goodness and for your graciousness. We bless your great name and we thank you for the word that you have helped us to share again this evening. I pray that it will find a place in all of our hearts and that as men and as women, we will do what it is that we must to ensure that ours is a great and lasting relationship. Be involved in our lives, I pray, almighty God. Be involved in our relationships, I pray. And I pray that you will show yourself strong on behalf of your people. Those that have just been married, I pray that you will bless them tremendously. Help them to learn from these lessons, O oh God, and strengthen their togetherness. Those that have been married for extended periods, God, intervene. Di redirect some things in their lives and have that they will surrender and submit to the will and the words of Almighty God. Have your own way. We bless you, great God, that your perfect will be done. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We thank you again for joining. And God's willing, um, as we said before, next week, same time. In Jesus' name, amen.